Each time the warm breeze swept over the hill, the forest moved. If a really strong gust hit it, the whole forest would rustle. Vegeta said he wanted to take a photo of the water tower, so he elected to pursue individual investigations. Vegeta moved around, looking for a good angle. I began taking notes on the view of town from the hill. In the distance were the mountains that marked the edge of the prefecture. There were green hills all over the place. The roofs on the tight rows of houses sparkled in the sunlight. Against the side of the hill was an apartment building that looked like shortcake. I could see the pointy steeple of the church where the lady prayed. The eye was naturally drawn to the giant shopping mall. The highway ran through all of this like it stitched across the neighborhood, and the lights moving across it were cars. From on top of this hill, I could see trees in town, and on far off hills, all swaying in the breeze. The sound of it didn't travel this far, but I could clearly see the wind's progress through the entire town. I wrote all this down in my notes. At last, Uchida came and sat next to me. We drank some tea. There were lots of hills in this area, like a lot of green beasts, oh, like a lot of green breasts rising up under the blue sky. I wiggled my loose tooth, thinking about breasts. Lately, I developed the opinion that breasts were of one were one of life's greatest mysteries. I often found myself thinking about the lady's breasts, but why were hers different from my mother's? They were the same physical object, so why was the effect they had on me so dramatically different? I never accidentally found myself staring at my mother's breasts, but I often caught myself doing just that with the ladies. I felt like I could never get tired of looking at them. I wondered what it would be like to touch them. The more I thought about it, the more baffling these things were. Was this what it meant to observe yourself? I talked about all this with Uchida. What do you think, Uchida? I don't know anything, he said, staring up at the water tower. His ears had turned red. Our rest ended there, and we stood up to go explore. But then we heard a squish, squish, squish from somewhere. Different from the sound of the wind of the forest. We looked around, wondering what it was, and saw a bunch of penguins walking along one of the paths out the woods. Yeah, Uchida choked, a very strange noise. The trails in the forest behind the water tower were covered in penguins. Some were running about, wings flapping behind them. Others were sunning, sunning themselves in the light drifting through the trees. Uchida and I traced the penguin highway backward. I was getting quite excited. I thought we had a chance to solve the mystery of where all these penguins came from. Our exploration's goal had suddenly become investigation, or had suddenly become investigating the penguin highway. We walked on, forgetting all about the wind whipping through the trees, about our map, about the water tower, and about breasts. Seven, eight, Uchida yelled. Nine, ten, uh, eleven, twelve, thirteen, I yelled back. The number of penguins soon passed twenty. We moved faster and faster until we were almost running. We found a place where the path narrowed, and here there were a bunch of penguins, all stuffed together like they were playing Oshikura Manju, that game where everybody stands back to back in a circle trying to squish together. At this point, we gave up counting them. When Uchida and I came running, the penguins scattered, opening a path for us. From then on, there were far fewer penguins. We'd been assumed the penguin rookery was deep in the forest, and they were entering town from there, but there was no sign of it. The path we were following suddenly turned and passed behind the nets of the athletic field. The field on the other side of the green net was deserted. There was a single penguin leaning against a tree, taking a nap, but it was all alone. Maybe this is the wrong way, Uchida suggested. We preserved passing along the back of the field, it was very quiet here. Inside the grove, we found the remains of a small truck. How it got there, I have no idea. At last, we came out in a flat clearing covered in thick grass. High tension towers loomed over us, reaching for the sky. The forest deposited us on an east side of the field. We pushed through the grass, headed north, and found a diagonal slope made of concrete. There was a long staircase leading down. At the bottom was a two-lane road. 
and beyond that was a lot for buses to turn around. This was the last stop on the bus line, the edge of our neighborhood. There were no penguins around. We gave to cross the field, stunned. We felt faintly silly for having chased the penguins like this. A cluster of clouds drifted across the sun, and it suddenly grew much darker. Uchida and I soon stood next to one of the towers, discussing our next move. Where'd the penguins come from? Uchida asked, staring up at the tower. I looked back at the forest. Maybe we stepped off the penguin highway somewhere. It might have come from somewhere deeper in the forest. We laid our half-drawn map down on grass and on the grass and discussed possible penguin origins. We were so focused on this that we didn't even notice Suzuki and his two minions until they had surrounded us. Uchida heard footsteps, glanced up, and immediately looked ready to cry. Suzuki came toward us, grinning. Ugh, Uchida's here, he said, disgusted. Saying nothing, Uchida just started backing away. Suzuki glared at me. As for you, he said, grabbing my shoulder. He was roughly the same height as me, but a little fatter. You're a liar. I ought to kill you. A liar? When did I lie? That crap at the dentist? You mean when you started crying at the dentist's office? Shut up! Suzuki turned beet red and punched me in the shoulder. You're a liar. Drop dead. I'm gonna kill you. I staggered a little, but managed to hold my ground. Do you really hate me enough to kill me? I really don't think killing me will do you any good. I won't be easy to kill. Before you manage it, I'll definitely be able to gouge your eyes out or bite your ears off. I bet that would really hurt. And then you'd be arrested. Your parents would cry a lot. If you hate me so much that you're willing to lose your eyes and ears and go to prison, then I guess you leave me with no choice. It's a shame, but I'll just have to fight back. This seemed to stun Suzuki a little. Shut up, he spat after a pause. You sure talk a lot of crap. I'm just trying to help you understand. Shut up. But I definitely did wrong you the other day, so I apologize. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. And I shouldn't have done that to you, too, Uchida, either. I bowed my head. Uchida looked startled. What? He asked. At the dentist. I tried to pay Suzuki back for a few things. He didn't ask me to, but I tried to get him back for you anyway. Without getting permission from you to act on your behalf, though, it was inappropriate for me to do anything to Suzuki. It wasn't fair. I should have asked you first, informed Suzuki of the fact, and then gone for payback. You've lost me, Uchida said. Suzuki growled, shut up! One more time, but then he started grinning. He had one of his minions hand me, hand him, a long piece of rope. I've got just the punishment in mind for you two, he announced. Uchida grabbed my arm. No, I said, we're busy. Suzuki's grin suddenly gave way to a much scarier expression. He jumped toward me. Uchida shrieked and ran away. I tried to run, but Suzuki grabbed my hair. Hey, Suzuki, that hurts! I shouted. Suzuki was yelling. You little... If my follicles were ruined and my hair didn't grow back, it would be Suzuki's fault. I grabbed Suzuki's crotch and squeezed, urging him to let go of my hair, and he squealed. I let go and shoved him back. He rolled across the grass, yelling. Damn it! Kill him! Kill him! Uchida! I yelled. I shouldered my rucksack, grabbed the map, and ran north across the plain. Let's run for it! Retreat! We ran down the long, exposed concrete stairs. Normally, we'd have gone away clean, but I stepped on an empty Coke can at the bottom of the stairs and tripped. Suzuki and his cronies piled on top of me. You're heavy! I, exp I complained. Uchida ran off down the deserted road really fast. At least he got away on the one bright side to this. They hauled me across the road to the bus terminal. It wasn't much of a terminal. It was about as big as a park, or as the park where we congregated on the way to school. There was a single, flimsy-covered waiting area in the front and a vending machine selling soft drinks. Suzuki brought the rope and tied me to the vending machine, arms at my sides. This was one of Suzuki Empire's famous punishments. The boys were often found tied to one thing or another. Suzuki also squeezed my crotch once as payback for earlier, so I grunted. Then he ordered his minions to dump my rucksack out on the road. The thermos full of, full of sweet tea was thrown into the forest behind the bus terminal. 
Suzuki shoved the map Uchida and I had made it. Suzuki shoved the map Uchida and I had made into his pocket. Then he put my notebook on the ground, and each of them pissed on it in turn. The notebook was ruined. Serves you right, Suzuki gloated, and the emperor of the Suzuki Empire went away. I waited patiently, trusted, or trust to the vending machine. Suzuki's lackey, Kobayashi, had done a very good job tying me up, and I was stuck standing at attention. His skills were impressive. The sunlight streaming down on the bus terminal was beautiful, but there was nobody there. On a Sunday afternoon, it could be a while before a bus came through. I listened to the sound of the wind and resolved to do what I could while I waited for someone to come and rescue me. I managed to move enough to get a hand in my pocket. I had a special tiny notebook there and a tiny ballpoint pen my father had bought for me. I practiced for this eventuality and I could now take notes with the notebook still in my pocket. I glanced over at the notebook on the asphalt, drenched in the Empire's piss that gleamed in the afternoon sunlight. Relying on my memory, I began transcribing the contents of that notebook, copying it. I looked up at the sky, listening to the soft song of a lark. A warm, gentle breeze ruffled my hair. It was a really beautiful afternoon. With nothing else to do, I became preoccupied with wiggling my loose tooth. It was slightly out of place to begin with, so I started pushing it around with my tongue. The sky was so blue, and here I was, all alone, wiggling a loose tooth, climbing the stairs to adulthood. That notion stuck, struck me as poetic, so I wrote it down. I'd like to write poetry someday, maybe if I had a hidden talent for it. I tried singing a little while, hoping this would help me forget the loose tooth. I could think of any other songs offhand, I couldn't think of any other songs offhand, so I was singing Jingle Bells, totally out of season. La 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 I heard someone laughing. I hadn't noticed at all, but somebody was sitting in the, wait in the waiting vestibule next to the vending machine. I recognized her by her laugh alone. A minute later, the lady stepped out. She was wearing blue clothes that looked like they'd been cut out of the heavens. She had a purse with her. She seemed sleepy, but was smiling. Her hair was a little muscle, moose. She came out into the sunlight, almost stepped on my notebook, yelped and jumped sideways. Then she pretended she'd only just seen me there. What are you doing, kiddo? Pretending to be a vending machine. Is that fun? It hasn't been very fun, no. You're an enigma, she laughed. This was Suzuki's idea of payback. After that lie, you only have yourself to blame. If you were there the whole time, you could have rescued me. But you didn't ask me to, right? I admit you have a point there. I conceded. What are you doing here? I wanted, I wanted to take a bus to the station, but in the end, it was too much of a pain. I took a rest in the vestibule here and nodded off. It happens. The lady untied the rope. Free again, I inspected the damage. My rucksack had been stomped on and was crumpled, but intact. I managed to find the thermos they'd thrown in the woods, but the notebook was soaked and beyond salvation. Don't know how they think up such nasty stuff, the lady mused, sounding impressed. Suzuki's kind of cute, but he can be pretty nasty. It's because he's an emperor. A what? My tooth was waggling, so I stuck my fingers in my mouth. Want me to yank that for you? She asked. No thanks. I've decided to get it out myself. I won't steer you wrong, I swear. Think of it as an experiment. Oh, I do like experiments. The lady took a sewing kit out of her purse, snipped off a piece of thread, and looped it around my loose tooth. The wind caught her hair, and it smelled really good. Now then, kiddo, I'm going to pull on this thread. Marvel as the tooth shoots right out. But when she tried to tug the thread, I moved with her, so the tooth didn't pop out. She wound up wandering around the bus terminal, and I followed, circling her like a satellite. Come on, she snapped. It obviously won't work if you follow me around like that. Stand still. I wasn't scared of having my tooth pulled. My body just moved on its own. The lady stopped in front of the red vending machine and said, I've got an idea. She put some change in and bought a can of Coke. Take a look at this, she suggested, tipping the can in my direction. Holding the stream taut, 
She tossed the can in the air above. She tossed the can in the air above my head. My eyes followed the red speck across the bright blue sky, but I didn't move my head at all. This trick would hardly be enough to get my tooth out, I thought. The cylinder spun as it arced across the horizon, like a spaceship using centrifugal force to create internal gravity. But just as the red can was about to vanish from view, something white covered it, like it had suddenly froze. Huh? I thought. This phenomenon started from the La in Coca-Cola and spread up the side of the can like a tsunami crossing the ocean. The white part seemed to foam and then turn black. The whole thing swelled as if it had taken a deep breath. Two black wings seemed to erupt off its sides. At this stage, the coke had turned into a black and white, unidentified flying can, large. It continued to expand, still spinning as it began losing altitude. Its tip stretched out, transforming into a beak, and flapping its wings, it landed in the middle of the bus terminal, rolling across the ground. When the, ca when the Coke can rightened itself, it was no longer a Coke can. Awkwardly flailing two black wings, the former Coke can waddled a few steps before stopping and staring up at the sky as if asking, Where am I? I had witnessed the birth of a penguin. I stared at the penguin a, a while longer until I tasted blood in my mouth. I turned back to the lady. She was standing in front of the vending machine, drinking from another can of Coke and holding out my tooth between her fingers. See? It popped right out, she said. I spat some bloody saliva onto the asphalt. She bought me some mineral water, so I swigged it a little at a time, washing the blood out of my mouth. What was that? I asked. A penguin, obviously, the lady declared. She plopped the free tooth in my palm and walked over to the penguin while sipping her coke. The penguin waddled toward her, almost tackling her legs then wandering around them. There was a gust of wind, and the lady put her hand on her forehead, as if warding off the sunlight. I'm an enigma too, she said. See if you can figure this mystery out. Think you can do it? All right, everyone, thank you for listening to part two of chapter one. If you enjoyed, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!